Well, good morning. <laughs> we are finishing today um, the series on Hebrews. In my planning, this was going to be a 13-week series, one week per chapter, and I felt like we were going too fast because it's really complicated and deep to go over that at that rate. And so we've been in this now for, I don't know, five months or something, and it's been a while, but today my sermon title is Final Words. So I say that as a comfort to you, um, but also as a clarification that we really are coming to the end of a letter that was written to this church I'll probably reference it towards the end of my message, but something we need to think about is that we often take bites over time of what the original audience would have gotten in one meal, right? I mean, likely is that this letter would have been read from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 13. Numbers didn't exist at the time. That they would have been hearing about the Hall of Faith, and they would have been hearing about all these things about who Jesus Christ was, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, Right? He is the, the new covenant, better than the old covenant. This would have been all true. And then at the end of today's message, it would have been now go and do, respond to the message. Sometimes the ending is really what's most anticipated, whether because we want it to end or because we want to know how it ends. I find this true when I'm often sitting at my couch looking at the screen this could be true for a sporting event. I really am excited at the last two minutes of a game, especially when it's close. I'm excited for overtime. I'm excited for extra innings in baseball or the um, golden goal in, in hockey, right? There's just this anticipation of, like, it could be over at any minute, but I'm excited to see how it ends. This is true for movies. This is true for shows. This is true for if you're a big fan of The Bachelorette or something. It's like, how is this going to end? We stumbled upon Masked Singer, and I think this next week is the finale of that to see who's going to win, who are these people. We really are curious to know how things end. Last night we were mean parents in the sense that we started watching Home Alone, but it was so late that we only got to watch the first half. And my son told me, Dad, the first half is boring. <laughs> Because we stopped it right when the burglars started in coming into the home. And that's when it gets exciting if you know the movie. But we'd just like to find out how things finish, how things end. Well, this, eve this morning, we're going to see how the book of Hebrews ends. And I think the writer does it intentionally with his final words. And I want us to think about how we should respond to the entire book of Hebrews this morning. So look at the question I want to ask you this morning is... Let me get the question real quick, and then we'll stand. But let me just have this thought in your mind real quick. Click on the question, the subject, the question. Thank you, Jim. Is how should we respond to the book of Hebrews? Now, this is not just a summary of what I want to think about for today's message, but really for the book as a whole. But I think how this book ends answers the book as a whole. <laughs> I think there is some themes that we see here at the end that really speak about the entire thing. So with that in mind, let's stand for the reverence of God's word. I will read this morning, verses 17 through 21. I'm well aware, yes, my Bible does go through 25, but let me just tell you that 20 through 25 is probably observed more of as a PS, as a message that uh, really 21 does end with an amen. So um, we'll read today verses 17 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Again, let me just give that statement again, that 22, 23, 24, 25, finishing the book, um, all scripture is God-breathed, 
So I'll read that uh, over you. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you, with, with, with whom I shall see you if he comes. Greet all your leaders and all the saints, those that come from Italy, send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. I think this message is good for us to know that these are real people. But it's harder to apply it to our faith because this seems like a specific message to the church that Hebrews is written to, which is why today's sermon will end at verse 21. But this morning I do want us to look at what we should do in response because, again, as this letter would have been read, as this message would have been given, then the people would have gone home. They would have left the fellowship where it was read over them, and life would have began in response, right? This letter came to bring some clarification, and now what are we going to do about it? That's really what I want us to ask even this morning. Well, I do find two answers in this, and the first thing we should do is we should partner with God's workers. Again, we should partner with God's workers. Look what it says in verses 17 through 19. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. They're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let me pause there and say that obedience and submission are, in our culture, often negative words. When a husband is over his wife and she submits to him and he is an authoritative figure who just demands whatever he wants gets made for dinner and whatever he wants is where they go on vacation, whatever he wants to watch is what's watched on television, that is not leadership and submission, biblically. (laughs) Biblical leaders consider others more important than themselves. Biblical leaders are really good listeners, taking care of those under their leadership. So obedience and submission in verse 17, though hard to hear, are God's design for us because by God's leading, the leaders of our country, of our homes, of our churches would be God-driven leaders, right? I would hope that the husbands in the midst of my hearing would be godly husbands, worth following. My hope would be that the fathers in the homes that I'm speaking to would be godly fathers. And if they're godly in their leadership, we would want to obey and submit to them because they are doing what God would want them to do. Amen? I do think that there are passages of Scripture. Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. He says that there are people that are in authority because God puts them there. Jesus says that even to Pilate, right? You would have no authority except that God gave it to you. Remember, God's in control. I do think, though, that this verse 17 is specifically speaking of our spiritual leaders. Notice why? Because they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account Let me pause there and speak to those of us in leadership, whether it be in church or in our homes. I do think that there are leadership opportunities in every gender, both male and female, that women are leading other friends in their Bible studies. There are great teachers who are leading the children of their classes. There are mothers who are leading their children through Bible study, through modeling what life looks like to be a godly woman. So as leaders... Are we keeping watch over people's souls? That's my first question. I ask this to myself because I I don't want to watch over your physical well-being, though that's important. I don't want to look over your emotional well-being, though that's important. I don't want to create behaviorists who live life in a certain way, who tuck in their shirt whenever they go to church, and who understand how to parallel park. And these things can become important, but they're not our primary goal, right? Our leadership goal is to watch over their souls. The Bible says, What gaineth the person to gain the entire world, but lose their soul? What gaineth your children to gain everything that the world would offer to them, but lose their soul? What gaineth your employees to gain everything the world would offer to them but lose their soul? What gaineth our church people if I direct them and help them to understand about hope if they gain everything the world offers but they lose their soul? Church, we as leaders need to be guarding the souls of those that we're leading. Now to do that takes tremendous attention, takes tremendous intentionality, 
And it takes tremendous knowledge of what God would actually want us to do that would be best for somebody's soul. This is a hard thing to hear probably for some, but when somebody calls and asks the church for giving to their needs, I often will respond the first time with a yes, within reason. But the second time I might ask, is giving them this money actually what's best for their soul? Is, is responding to what they're asking for really what I need to give them? I'm reminded of Jesus who finds the crippled man and says, Jesus, make me walk. And he says, your sins are forgiven. And the people are like, who are you to forgive sins? And he says, that you would know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. Take up your bed and walk. The man wanted to be walking, and Jesus forgave him, caring for his soul. Things of the physical and emotional and social are easier to manage. They're easier to gauge. They're easier to grade. I know that I can effectively lead my children by making sure there's food in the fridge and making sure that there's clothes on their back. But are we focusing on watching over their souls? Let me encourage you to know this is not just people that are ordained. This is not just people that are missionaries. These leaders that are watching over their souls Everyone in the hearing of my voice is that in some capacity. Let's say you're an older sibling and you have younger siblings below you. You have opportunity to care for your your brother and sister. You can be praying for them. You can be helping them growing in their faith. There's opportunity to be leading by watching over their souls. But notice how that sentence ends in 17. As those who will have to give an account. This is an important truth. Not to scare us. The reality of my life or many people's lives probably, is that we are so afraid of giving an account because the word account, accountant, often we think about being audited. And do I have all the receipts? And did I do everything correctly? Are they going to find my problems? Biblically, I would say this account would be more of a testify. It would be an opportunity for us to declare to the Lord what we did do in our leadership. I did encourage these people in their faith. I did give a knowledge of the gospel to those that were lost, that this is an account that we are giving, right? It is not, God's not looking for ways to judge us and to punish us. He wants us to declare what we have done. We're going to give an account. But it holds us accountable, those of us that are leaders, because we need to be careful that we're doing the main thing, that we're doing what's most important. We are God's workers. We need to be. Speaking of these leaders, look what it says at the end of that verse there. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning. Some of them might say grumbling or grief, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let me pause there and ask a question. It's a good way to study the Word of God. Why would it not be advantage to the audience if the leaders are groaning and grieving and not filled with joy? Let me encourage you in this way what the Lord has put on my heart. I think grieving leaders, I think people that are groaning to their leadership makes it harder to lead and harder to obey because it breaks the communication between leader and follower. Would you agree? That when there is this disgruntled, oh, I guess I'll do it, that there just comes a little bit of a numbness to the attentiveness of what really is needed Sometimes we just kind of get really tired of leading people who don't want to be led. And so if we have people that are leading over us, we can encourage their leadership. We don't always agree with it, but we can say, thank you for what you are doing. I'm praying for you. There can be an encouragement that motivates the leaders to lead better. And most importantly, to be more aware of those they're leading. Because if I'm honest, there are people that just like never listen to what I want to say, and I'm just going to call them a little less. Because they never hear what I have to tell them. That's a discouragement. I need to call them. But it just gets tiring sometimes in our humanness to say, I'm going to lead those that don't want to be led. The famous saying, right, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> Somebody once said, you can make a horse really thirsty. Right, our leadership can cause people to want to drink. Our leadership can cause people to want to receive the phone call and want to receive the opinion because we live such a godly life that I really want to know what you would have to say about this. What what would you do if you were in my situation? These are the kind of questions that would come by just watching a leader live a godly life. 
But as people that are following, myself included, as I follow leadership above me and as I follow the Lord, is I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve those in leadership because it does numb the influence. But look what it says in verses 18 through 19. The writer of this letter, again, some believe to be Paul. It's not known for who it really is. But a spiritual leader, author of God's word, says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you to the more earnestly to do this, in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. And it's a powerful thing when Paul or anybody else asks the congregation he's writing to to pray for them. Because it's not only what the leadership can do for you. It's what you can do for leadership. It is a two-way street. It is not just a consumer mentality. It is those that are blessed can be a blessing. Those that are loved can love other people. Those that are given to can give to others, right? And so the leadership here in this author of this book of Hebrews says, pray for us. Let me just encourage you, myself as your pastor, but also as our elders, as I showed last week, we need your prayers. We are desperate for the Lord to guide us, to lead us. And we would not be able to do what we do without the prayers of God's people. So thank you. But please don't stop. Pray for us. I love that the author here says we are sure that we have a clear conscience. I don't know that if I'm writing this letter I can say that. Can you? Clear conscience, no regrets, <laughs> desiring to act honorably in all things. A question that I stirred in this way is who defines honor? We um, know that there are cultures in Asia and even um, in other parts of the world where there is an honor culture where I do certain things because it makes my family's name be thought of higher esteem, right? I don't want to hurt the name of my family. That is an honor culture. And church, we need to remember that we are children of God. And when we act honorably, it's making the name of God, Jesus Christ, more raised in culture than it is spat upon or seen in negatively. Culture doesn't define honor. To be honorably is not to be beloved by those around us. Jesus said, the world hated me, it'll hate you also. So it's not to be honored by culture, but it's to honor the name that we've been given as children of God. That's what it means to act honorably in all things. And this prayer again that he says in 19, he asks them to do it more, more earnestly. Why? Because he wants to be reunited with them. There's something that we can do from a distance, and our generation of kids know this more than anybody else because they do texting and social media and all that stuff, but there's nothing like face-to-face. -face. Would you agree? There, there's something that just being there in person is different than a message from afar. This is true for spouses who have loved ones overseas fighting in the military. It's great to get the note from them or to see them on a computer screen, but to have them home, to get the embrace, to be able to actually see and touch and be in the same room as them is, is meaningful, is powerful. This author wants to do that with this audience. He wants to be there to encourage them in person. Now, church, let me, let me add this little note, and then we'll move on to the next point. But there's power to our prayers, <laughs> right? I mean, if these people don't pray, could God still make a way for the author to be with them? Yes. But he's used the tool of prayer to move back darkness, to remove barriers, to make a way where there seems to be no way. The prayers of God's people can move mountains. Prayers of God's people is a powerful thing. Does God have to because we ask him to? No. But God loves to respond to the requests of his people. I'm reminded of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who tell the king when they're about to be burned in a furnace, our God is able to save us, but even if he won't, we will praise his name. Right? That's what Jesus said even in the garden. If it if be possible, let this cup pass from me, but, but not my will be done, but your will be done. That's the prayer of a godly child of the king. Make your request known to him, but believe that his will is best, that he will do what is best for those he loves. In this idea of working together, 
partnering with God's workers, both leadership and followers working in partnership with each other. We need each other. I'm reminded of the game of football. And I don't know if you had the opportunity to do this, but I played on Thanksgiving morning, uh, touch football, shove football, um, not quite tackle. Any of you have had that experience in your younger days, maybe. Um, it's a Thanksgiving tradition. I've only actually played Thanksgiving football that I can recall two or three times in my life, but I had the honor of doing it this last Thursday. A situation happened in that game. I was a receiver and a quarterback was on my team trying to throw you know, a touchdown. And in regular football, you have plays, but in backyard football, you just run around and hope they understand what you're about to do. And I'm really knowledgeable about how football works in some regards, and so I fake out my opponent to get open. But did you know what fakes out a defender sometimes fakes out a quarterback? Like, I went to the right to be ready to go to the left, and the quarterback threw the ball to the right, and the ball got intercepted because there was not clear communication. <laughs> this happens in football, too. I think about the people on the line, the big guys who um, protect their quarterback, right? That if, if I am thinking I'm going to block this guy, and you're, um, you're going to block that guy, and they have a miscommunication, there can be a lot of damage that happens, right? Because they're not working together. Church, I bring this up because we're on the same team, Remember? as believers. It's easy to say that as hillside people, but let me remind you, we're on the same team as other Bible-believing churches too, right? That the other churches in Crown Point, the other churches in our country and in our world are part of the same team. Are we working together? Do we have a clear conscience? Are we praying for one another? Are we submitting to the leadership and obeying those that are above us? Are we hoping that they're following the Lord as they direct us in their leadership? Church, united as a church, Capital C, global believing body, we would do incredible things to change our world. God can work through what we have, but I encourage us to think about what could be if we work together. And when we don't work together, when we don't communicate, it often results in things that we wish never would have happened. You know, one of the biggest negatives people have of the church Maybe they come to church at Christmas or something, but there's just people who say one thing and do another. They say they love me, but they judge me because of what I wore to church that Sunday. Or they say they love me, but they, they don't really come around when I need them. That, that's what the world sees of the church. We're right to raise the bar of our standard, but we need to live up to it too, right? Walk the walk. Talk the talk. Be who God called us to be. That's going to be, first and foremost, partnering with those that are God's people, God's workers, living this life together. So how should we respond to the book of Hebrews? Second of all, we see that we should respond by partnering with God's will. So God's workers, part one. Point two, God's will. This is a benediction in my Bible. Um, Adam doesn't have to use it today, but it would be fitting. It's an idea that we, benedictions are final statements, right? These words to leave on. Look what this one says. Somebody said this is one of the most powerful benedictions in the Bible. I'll read it in its entirety. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the sh great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do as well working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me skip over some of the language here because look what it says in verse 20, connecting to 21. Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do as well. That's what it says. May the God of peace equip you with everything good to do as well. Who is this God of peace? Remember what he's done for us? That's where 20 intercepts this important concept Remember God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus speaks of his power, speaks of his fulfillment of promises. He said he would raise him from the dead, and he did. Jesus said that his sacrifice would be accepted by the Lord, and it was. There's a great gospel spoken word thing on YouTube. I think it's by Propaganda. I showed it to Ed Pulowski on Saturday, but it talks about how when Jesus died on the cross, the check was written. 
And when he rose from the dead on Easter morning, the check cleared. There was enough in the account to make the payment. God said, yes, accepted. So Jesus has been raised. But remember, Jesus Christ, throughout this entire book, he is the great shepherd of the sheep. Remember, he has an eternal covenant through his blood. We have referenced earlier that he's greater than everything. He's greater than Moses, greater than the angels, greater than the system of worship that God had told them to use. Jesus is the greatest, and he's alive. So he still is the greatest. He is our shepherd as his sheep. Shepherds protect us. They direct us. They provide for us. Obedience of a sheep to a shepherd is understood because they love their sheep. They do what's best for their sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. He calls us, myself as a pastor, those of us in spiritual leadership, to be under shepherds, to be shepherds of the sheep as well. But we do in obedience to what he has done. A great leader must first be a great follower. This concept of God, of peace, is another element. We're going to talk about peace in the last Sunday of Advent. But it's a, an element that we probably would say we need in our world today, don't you think? More so, the audience of this letter, the God of peace. Because not only is there chaos around them, <laughs> there's chaos amongst their midst. There's confusion on, should we stay with what we've been given, or should we pursue the Jewish traditions? And there's chaos, and we need the God of peace to be the one that comes. Remember, he, the one that raised Christ from the dead, the one that has forgiven us through the blood of the covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do as well. Church, let me ask you a question, myself included. Do we believe that God has given you what you need to accomplish his will? Do you believe that? Not, not would you write it on a sheet of paper, but do you live in obedience to the fact that God has given you enough? to accomplish his will for today. He might not have given you what you need to do to accomplish his will next week because you're not there yet. But to obey him in the moment, to say no to the temptations, to respond with love when people come at you with certain problems, to do God's will, he's given you enough. He's given what you what you need. Primarily, love through Jesus Christ. We love because he first loved us. But secondarily, and really important, that would be the gift of the Holy Spirit, because we have within us, right? We are the temple of God, the Spirit of God, who brings conviction, who brings encouragement. We are well equipped to do God's will. Many of us waste time, understandably so. I did it for a long time, too, of asking, what is his will? And let me encourage you, it's an obedience to the Spirit, the convictions that the Lord brings our heart is just saying yes to him when he says to do something. Saying no when he says not to do it. Responding to the promptings of the Spirit. I said it this morning in Sunday school, but when the Spirit brings a person's name on your heart that you haven't thought of in years, it probably is a motivation to pray for them. Because there's something about that person that in this moment God needs your prayers to encourage them through the Spirit, right? That obedience to the Spirit is the will of God. Yes, we obey our leaders, verse 17, but we obey the Lord and his spirit. Finally, here it says that he's working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. It's important to know that it's not all on you. We have our part, but God doesn't just leave you alone to figure it out. He's there working with us, working in us the things that he wants, that he's designed for us to pursue. And then notice how it ends, through Jesus Christ. Remember, we wouldn't be able to do any of this if it weren't for him. If Christ didn't come in the form of a baby, if he didn't die on the cross thousands of years ago, this journey of obedience to the Lord, pursuing his will, working with his workers wouldn't be possible because there would be no children of God if Jesus never died on that cross. There would be no children of God if Jesus never was born in that manger. It is through Jesus Christ. Notice it is to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And the word amen is let it be. Let it be so. Church, my final 
charge to you or to us as we finish this is we would say that God is worthy of glory. We give you all the glory. We just sang that, right? We, we want to pursue him and give him all the glory. We would say that his, he deserves the choir of the world to bow their knee before his throne. Let me ask, though, if you think about your role in that musical ensemble, or are you just content with everybody else singing the praise? How can you in your life bring Jesus glory? If to him be glory forever and ever, how can in this moment, in this day, in this week, in this year, how can you bring him glory? That's that idea of the clear conscience. That's that idea of acting honorably in all things. That's that idea of obeying the Spirit. It brings him glory. When he gets to be not only your Savior, but your King, it puts him where he's supposed to be. It shines the light on Jesus Christ not on ourselves. If I'm honest, this is probably one of the hardest things in our culture because our culture loves to say, hey, you deserve the spotlight. And I've used it before, but I think it's worth saying again. I think there's an element here that we need to be like the moon. If you guys know what I'm referencing, there's an element where the moon itself does not create light, but it's an incredible reflector of light. If you have the opportunity in the nighttime to look out in the sky and you see the moon, it's because the sun is shining on it and it is reflecting it off of it. That's what we need to be, reflectors. That when people look at us and say, man, you're, you're living such an incredible life. Yeah, thanks be to God. If Jesus didn't save my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. I, I wouldn't be able to do it without him. And we reflect the praise, the glory, the light. It's hard, but it is an honor to do so. This idea of doing God's will reminds me of a current reality that many of you will fall into, and that is making Christmas cookies. Maybe even for next week's uh, Christmas trolley singing, but for your house, for your home. What I'm thinking about here is not just purchasing them from Strax or um, asking somebody to make them for you, but let's say you have a family tradition where grandma just has this recipe for this cookie that you have to make every year. Anybody? have the tradition of a, a cookie in your family that has to get made and it's made a certain way, maybe on certain trays or with certain cookie cutters. I mean, there's something about the tradition of those things, right? Now, church, let me ask you a question. And again, grandmothers who have these recipes often aren't here to scold us. But we can feel the scolding of our grandmothers as we make them now, even today. What if you were to tweak the recipe? What if there was this famous gingerbread cookie recipe, and you were like, yeah, I'm going to use a little bit more cinnamon, or I'm going to trade out this ingredient for another. Are you making grandma's gingerbread cookie anymore? Isn't there something about keeping to the recipe, following what was asked of you? Well, church, the reality is that God, the observer of all things, the creator of all things, we saw in Colossians that in Christ and through Christ all things were made for him, he is the one who knows the ingredients to what it means to live a godly life. He's the one that knows what it means to live a life that is in obedience to him. And these Hebrew audience here, this, people that were getting this letter were saying, I, I like what you've given me, but I want to change it a little bit. They wanted to change the recipe. It's not just the problem of this previous audience, because reality is we like to change the recipe too, don't we? I mean, we understand the days are different. Grandma didn't even know that they could do certain things, and this ingredient didn't even exist. If, if she would have known, she would have added it. Well, there's a reality that God knows. He is beyond all time. There's nothing new under the sun, it says in Ecclesiastes. There's nothing that we need to add to the gospel. God didn't forget something. He's perfect. And so when God says this is the way it should be done, we need to follow the recipe. Now, what does that mean for us as it comes to this book? I think there's elements that this audience, again, was confused primarily with the gospel, with what it meant to be saved, with how they would perceive forgiveness. And that has been clearly laid out. It says that it is by grace you have been saved, not by works, lest anyone should boast. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. There are elements that we understand that if you confess and if you believe, right, if we believe that Jesus is raised from the dead and confess that he is Lord, that we will be saved, Romans 10, 9. There are elements that we need to understand that the gospel is really simple, but really hard. It's so simple that a child could understand it. It's so simple that any person could just believe in it. But it's really hard to actually give your life to be saved. In January, we're going to have the opportunity uh, to go on a missions trip to Mexico. And in my absence, we will have uh, a guest preacher. And then on the second Sunday, Joe Brown is going to preach. And on that Sunday, we're going to have a baptism Sunday, January 29th, I think it is. And uh, there are people that in that baptism Sunday are going to be young because children have accepted the Lord. Praise be to God. But there are also people that are older that need to accept Christ. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if Jesus hasn't saved you in the sense that he is now ruling over your life, let me ask you to consider the importance of that question. Because without Jesus, you will not find hope. Without Jesus, you will lose your soul. It is this element that really ends our conversation on the book of Hebrews. Is Jesus greater? Let me pause long enough for you to consider things that might be greater than Jesus. Fears, <laughs> anxieties, dreams, hopes, accomplishments. Is Jesus greater? I'll be honest and tell you that there are days when I can answer that with a resounding yes. And there are days that I regrettably whisper a no. Am I alone in that? It is a journey, isn't it? Today's decision of Jesus is greater does not mean tomorrow there will be a victory in that same question. We need to ask again and again, is Jesus greater? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we declare, we believe, we are taught that Jesus is the greatest. He's greater than any created thing. He's greater than any idea greater than any religion, greater than any tradition. At the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, every knee will bow, and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. There are a lot of important questions, God, but this morning we need to ask, who is Jesus Christ? To you, who is Jesus Christ to me? It's a good start to the question to say he was a baby born in a manger long ago. But I, to that answer I say, why did he come? It's a great answer to say that he died on a cross for the sins of the world. And so that I would say, why did he die? God, we do personalize these things to say that he came for me. He came for you. He died for me. He died for you. Love is really the reason that motivated Jesus, that motivated Jesus Christ to come to this earth. And it is love that motivated him to die. Because God desires that none would perish because he loves us. Help us to trust you more, Lord, to believe you even when it's hard to understand, 
to walk by faith, not by sight, to obey you, working in partnership with your people and pursuing your will, believing that what you want is best. So Lord, I end this prayer with your prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors. God, I do ask that you would forgive us that you would lead us. We need you. To you be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.